All right, well, good evening. Um, all right, last week we started off in Romans chapter 1. Uh, last week kind of kicked off our study of the book of Romans. And we're going to pick up again tonight. And I will tell you, I debated and asked quite a few people, kind of went back and forth on how far to go tonight. But we're just going to cover, I guess I'd say, the first half of the second half of Romans 1, if that makes any sense. I was going to bust Romans 1 into two sections, but now I decided the second half of Romans 1 needs to be two sermons in and of itself. So tonight we're going to be looking at uh, verses 18 through 25 in Romans chapter 1. Now, I want to start by kind of going back and, and uh, thinking about one day in particular, but I mean, I can think of the whole school year. I, I'm not even 100% sure of what what exact year it was. Um, I think I think my sophomore or junior year of high school, I had one class in particular that was in a T building, and Nathaniel, you may have even been in that class with me. If y'all don't know, we graduated together and went to school together from little kids on up, uh, but we had a teacher who was new to Live Oak that year who had moved from Texas. I remember that much about her, and, uh, and I remember her name even. I'm pretty sure her name was Miss Jewel, but uh, anyway, she moved over, and we had a, some kids in the class that were bad. This lady was super sweet. She had kind of that Texas accent. She was a, I don't know what she was. To me, she was an older lady at the time. That probably meant she was like 30. I don't know. But, but, uh, but I remember thinking she was an older teacher, been doing it for a while. And she was super nice, really sweet, uh, never got worked up or anything. But we had some bad kids in the class who I very much remember, and I've run into recently around here at the store. I won't name them, but we had a couple little punks in that class that would push her to no end. I mean, they just did stuff, the kind of stuff that to me, it was blatant and obvious what they were doing. And I kept thinking, how is she okay with this? But she was one of those people that was just completely cool and just never got worked up, just kind of okay. You know, and this guy would, would be like throwing trash. He would just ball some random piece of paper up and chunk it across the room to try and make it in a trash can. And it would hit the board and fall on the floor. And she'd look and say, who just threw it and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was trying to throw it in the garbage. That was all. And she's, okay. Well, clearly, he's just being disruptive, getting everybody to laugh at him for throwing paper across the room, the things that teenagers typically do to get attention or to look cool. And he would do these things nonstop. One day, he starts, starts going at it with spitballs, spitting around the room. And she could see him. She's kind of like, okay, funny, funny. Let's put spitballs down. And he kept on and kept on and kept on. And he pushed her and pushed her, and that woman snapped like I've never seen someone snap. I mean, it was like a complete change. She turned, and that blonde hair, it's like you can see smoke coming out of her nose. It's just She had had enough, and she lost her cool. And that day, we saw the wrath of Miss Jewel come down on that class. And I thought, holy cow, she is not playing around. She was hot. I'm talking about mad. Anybody ever experienced someone who just all of a sudden got extremely like full of wrath and just kind of blew up? Yes, maybe. Some of you had teachers. Don't say your parents. Your parents are all sweet and wonderful. I know they would never get mad like that. But you've probably all had a teacher at some point that some kid provoked them and provoked them, or maybe they just had a bad day and were slightly provoked. But whatever the case, they lost their cool and just blew up. I saw one of our football coaches just last week at the scrimmage come unglued because the media people filled up the whole uh, press box upstairs. And he starts, and his coaches come walking back down on the field like, well, I don't know where to sit. And he started screaming, I don't care who you are, get out of that box. That box's primary thing, purpose is for my coaches to watch the field, see my players. And you saw a side of him that we have not yet seen before when he just screaming from the, everybody in the whole field, hundreds of people all got quiet and listened like, oh my goodness. We saw that wrath kind of come out. Well, tonight, the main topic, what we're looking at is wrath, but God's wrath. Not something super popular that we like to talk about all the time, because we love to think just God is love and leave it at that. However, we see the wrath of God tonight. So let's start reading verse 18. Look at what it says in Romans 1, verse 18. Paul writes and says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, I think it's important that we have the right view of what God's wrath is. 
I just told you a story about a teacher that I had and how we saw her wrath or a coach or I can tell you as a parent, there's been times where I have just like had enough and you lose it just the other night. I know Chatty grabbed a box of cereal. However, she picked it up from the bottom and picked straight up in the air and a whole entire box of Lucky Charms just whoosh, went out everywhere and it had been a long, stressful day and I can remember Miss Rachel was kind of looking at me and saying, get her and do something about that cereal. I'm done. I'm done. Like, my wrath is going to come out. I'm done. You know? and, and we all get to that point. But in this passage, some of the God, that, the God that created everything, his wrath. And how is that different? Well, first off, we know this, that, that on the one hand, God's wrath, it's controlled and orderly. See, there's two different words you could use for anger or wrath in the Bible, and one of them is the word from which uh, temptos, where we get temperature or thermometer, where we get that English word. So it means like red hot, angry, like on the fly. You just blow up. I would say that was what that teacher or that coach or that parent, when they have just had enough and explode, that is that type of anger. That is not what the Bible uses to describe God's anger or God's wrath. Rather, when the Bible speaks of his wrath, it uses a different word. It uses a different word um, that means a controlled, kind of like monitored. It's orderly. It's not just thrown out there randomly, but it's a very orderly thing. And so that's how God's wrath is. It's not just cast out there for whatever. We laugh because we kind of have a saying in our house, uh, everybody's been around little babies, and you know if they haven't had a nap, they've had enough, and they're just like easily set off. You could say one wrong thing to them, and they just blow up. Well, every now and then you hear one of the kids come in and say, Chatty's raging right now. She's raging, and that's what we'll say. She's raging because she's just like, had enough. It's not that kind of uncontrollable. You've all seen kids that get on the floor and just pound their fists and scream and holler. That's not the God of the Bible. It is controlled, it's orderly, but it is there. It is absolutely there. His wrath also is paralleled, if you look at this text, with his righteousness. Think about what verse 17 says. For righteousness, the righteousness of God is revealed. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. They both start off with four. You can follow these fours, just a heads up, if you like to note things in your Bible. There's a bunch of these verses in a row that all say for this, for this, for that, for that. And it culminates down at the end, we'll get to in a little while, with therefore, and it kind of gives you your conclusion. You can see Paul thinking through this. He says, so the righteousness of God is this, for faith, by faith, but the wrath of God is revealed this way. And so it's a, an exact parallel with, with his righteousness, his, his love, all those good things we know about him. And I know I've used this example Tons of times I will keep using it because I don't think there's any better way to illustrate it. But I have a general love for people, yes, but I have a special love for my wife because I'm married to her. That's my wife. It's not your wife, and I, you're not my wife like that. I have one wife, that's it. And so even though I love people, if something happens to somebody who lives in Billings, Montana, I'm not leaving this service right now just taking the mic off and taking off to drive to Billings, Montana to go see what happened to this person. However, if my wife were in Billings, Montana for work right now, and somebody called me and said, hey, somebody just hurt your wife on purpose, somebody attacked her, you better believe I would dump this mic off and say, hey, y'all figure something out tonight. I'm gone. I'm leaving. I'm going to Billings, Montana. I'm fixing to see what's going on. Why? Because there's a higher level of love there. Therefore, my anger towards this person who's done something to her, it's different than my anger towards somebody who's committed a crime there that I don't even know who? I don't know anybody who lives in Billings, Montana. I just randomly picked a city in a state that I don't know anything about. The greater the love is, the greater the wrath is towards anything opposed to that love. Make sense? We've been through this enough. Y'all get, get that? The more you love something, the more you hate anything that's opposed to it. And so when you have the righteousness of God, the more God loves holiness and, and his creation that we were created to have a relationship with him and so the more he loves us the more he hates and is wrathful towards anything that pulls us away from him unrighteousness in other words sinfulness so the greater love also has the greater wrath those two go hand in hand you can't have a tremendous amount of love and no wrath at all because just think if something happened to my wife somebody attacked her and i was kind of like oh huh whatever 
what would the first thing people say be? What would the first thing people would say about me? Well, you must not love her if you don't even care. And so we see that God's wrath is parallel with his righteousness. We also see that his wrath is not just cast out there to hit whomever, whenever, why ever. Think about what it says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, and it personalizes it, by their trans unrighteousness suppress the truth. So it's pointed specifically at those who are ungodly and unrighteous. And if you think about those two words, ungodly means you're sinning against God. There's your first four commandments. If you're unrighteous, it means you're not living a holy life. I'm sinning against you all, humanity, people. That's the second six of the Ten Commandments. First four are what we call vertical. That's you and God. And the next six are you and those around you, how you treat your neighbors, how you treat those. He's saying if you are someone who's ungodly and unrighteous, that's the person this wrath is going out to. Also, a couple more points just to note. Um, There's only a few places in Scripture, and I don't have them listed down, but I I don't even remember exactly, so I'm going to kind of guess and round off, but I think it's either three or four times in all of the New Testament that it's referred to as God's wrath. Outside of that, it's, it's, his wrath is mentioned numerous, 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 I don't know how many times, a whole bunch. But it's just stated as wrath. Just wrath, not God's wrath. Why? Why do you think they would just say the penalty is wrath, not the penalty is God's wrath? Here's, here's what I would think. Um, God has set things in motion. There's a plan He created us. He created the moral law. We all know it. We try to live by that and honor God. If you do something sinful, that wrath is part of those consequences. Sin has a nasty tail, right? There are laws of, think of nature. There are laws of nature. We we know how things function here on earth. If you walk to the edge of the Grand Canyon and just jump off, that's a pretty dumb decision, right? It's, It's like a mile down. You're not going to make it. You're not going to live. If you do that, God doesn't have to come around and say, oh, my goodness, that goes against the law of nature. I better do something. No, like, look, I, I made nature. I made the laws of nature. Gravity is a real thing. You can try it out whenever you want. Like, I, I promise it's real. You jump, you're going to fall, and you're going to die because that's what happens when you jump off the Grand Canyon. God doesn't have to swoop in and say, let me do this. It's kind of the same way with his wrath. You live an ungodly and an unrighteous lifestyle. It's not like God's sitting up there like Zeus with a big thunderbolt waiting to strike you down and tag you every time. He's saying, if you want to live a holy life, here's how you live. But if you reject that and say, I'm going to live ungodly, unrighteous life, then you receive the wrath of God. I hope that makes sense, but it's not trying to personalize. It's trying to say, This is how you're supposed to live. If you don't, wrath is coming for you. That's what's coming. So what can we learn about these people? We see that it's not just thrown out for everybody. This is for people who are ungodly and unrighteous. Even though I would hope and pray that there, you, none of you would say, yes, I'm an ungodly, unrighteous person. But most of us here would say, yes, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. We can still learn something from looking at what Paul says about these people. So three things I want to point out through Uh, verse 25, that I want us to look at tonight and discuss afterwards. So, here's how they go. One, they suppress the truth. They suppress the truth. Look at verse 19. It says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So it says there that what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. What did he show to them? His invisible attributes. Not every single thing that's written in Scripture, but God has made it plain. Namely, it even tells you what those invisible attributes are. His eternal power and his divine nature. They've been clearly perceived. 
not hidden. You don't have to be some scholar. You don't have to be some super wise guy to be able to figure this out. They are clearly there, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. And so we see there, uh, and that follows 18, where it says, who by their unrighteousness, they suppress that truth. The truth that's been clearly put out there, they suppress it. Now that word for suppress, it's, it's an active thing. It's not like it was suppressed and now it's done. It's a continual, steady suppressing, constantly. Like they're constantly suppressing this thing and pressing it down. It's, anybody ever got a big blow up like a beach ball and you try and hold it underwater? Seems like everybody at some point has gotten some kind of ball and you try to hold it underwater. And what happens? It's constantly popping up. If you let go for one second, it's going to plop up because it's air. It's trying to float and go to the top. You have to struggle to stay on that thing. The second you lit up, it boom, pops up out the water. It's that same kind of mentality with these people that he's talking about here. They are constantly, continually suppressing it because it's right there and it's obvious. Like It's like that beach ball keeps popping up, popping up, popping up over and over and over. So does the truth of who God is through his creation. But they continually suppress it and push it down. What do they suppress? The truth about who God is. Just what it said there. His invisible attributes, which are his eternal power and his divine nature. I listened to, uh, I've referenced an old guy. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, R.C. Sproul is a Presbyterian. He was great. I loved R.C. Sproul. But R.C. Sproul uh, told a story about how he was asked to come speak and, and give a lecture to a group called the Atheist Club. And he thought, wait a minute, you know I'm like a Christian apologist, like I've got a PhD in Christian studies, like I'm a, I teach at seminary and all that, like I'm a Christian, through and through, 100%. And I'm like, yeah, I know. We want you to come speak to our atheist club and give your best arguments for the existence of God. So he said, okay, I'll do it. And so he did. He showed up. And he gave this long, very academic uh, lecture with proof of the existence of God. But then he got to the end, and he had just a couple minutes left, and he said, all right, I've gone through all the academic stuff. That's done, because that's what you asked me to do. But you know what's really on my mind? What I really want to tell you? I'm going to speak just from the heart in the last one minute of my time with you. He said, I did what you wanted me to do, however... I don't believe, I don't believe in atheist. I don't believe none of you are truly atheist. And of course, he started getting some funny looks from him, like, okay, we are the atheist club. How, how could you say you don't believe in atheists? We're right here, and I'm telling you, I'm an atheist. He said, I know, but my God has said that he has made himself clearly known through his creation, and you have to actively suppress that truth. Your problem is not that there's a lack of evidence for God, and it's not that you don't deep down in your heart of hearts, believe that God exists, it's that you despise that God. And so you reject him, and you continually reject him and look for something else, whether it be through science or through whatever, you continually reject him. That's what's really happening. I don't need to give you some superb delivery of truth to change your mind. You know it. You just hate that God. That's your problem. And then he said, the whole room changed, and they were irate. They were furious with him. But he told them just as it is, and they could not handle that. They couldn't handle it. This suppression of truth. Look, I know that was a serious, weighty thing. We were talking this morning, and I can remember having a conversation with some friends of mine that I've just kind of somewhat been reunited with. But uh, uh, anyways, Kelly and Dana Russell, and I was... Remember sitting in a deacon's meeting with Kelly Russell years ago. Yeah, I mean, this has got to be 10 years ago. And we were talking about biscuits. And I made the comment, well, homemade biscuits are just so much better than anything else. Like, I love a good homemade biscuit. And I do. I love a homemade biscuit. And he said, oh, no, Mary B's. That's the best biscuit you'll eat. I said, no. I mean, they're good. They're better than, like, canned biscuits, like Watt biscuits. They're not a bad biscuit, but it's still a frozen biscuit. Like, it does not compare to a good homemade. Anybody ever go to Indian Mound and get those biscuits? Look, that's a good biscuit. 
That's still not what I would call a good homemade. It's as close as you're going to get to one of Grandma's good homemade iron skillet biscuits. You know, those are good biscuits. They are not the same as McDonald's or Mary B's or Wop biscuits. Clearly, there's a difference. And I kept arguing with him, and I thought, how do you not agree with me? And he was determined. Nope, Mary B's. I said, man, Mary. B I'm not bashing Mary B's, but clearly, Mary B's is not as good as a homemade buttermilk biscuit. And he had to kind of admit after the end, because I couldn't let it go. It was kind of a joke between us, you know. He used to be my youth leader. Now I'm a deacon with him, so I got to badger him back and forth. Like, now we're both grown men. How you like it? You know, and so we're arguing back and forth. And finally I got him to admit, okay, well, they're better, but they take a lot longer to make. Mary B's are easy. Put them on a pan, put them in an oven, they're done. I can eat them quick. You see, it's not that he didn't like the homemade biscuit or didn't think that the homemade biscuit was better it's that he despised the work that had to go into it. He wanted something quick and easy. Throw it in the oven, it's done, I'm out. I don't have to get flour, get hog lard, get buttermilk, mix it all up, roll it out, dry my hands, put some flour on them, and then make, form them all up. Like, it's too much work to make homemade biscuits. I despise that. Therefore, I'm going to say I like this. It's the same thing with this group of atheists that were here. It's the same thing that our text tells us about those unrighteous, ungodly people, it's not that they don't have the evidence or don't really believe in their heart of hearts that God is there and that he exists. Clearly, you can perceive that through creation. He's saying they are suppressing that truth. They don't like the God. That's why they say they don't believe in him, and they reject him. God is revealed through creation, not just random chance. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have any change on me. Um, I started to try this. I probably don't need to try it. But think about the odds of, of some of these things. Think about how finely tuned our universe is. Uh, look, I didn't take any copious notes to try and come up with. Because you'd probably get bored. You don't really care anyway. But I watched a documentary a while back. And it, the one part I can remember about it is this guy. Uh, all right, this is going to sound gross. He was dissecting a giraffe. All right, dissecting a giraffe. But as they're going through this, these scientists are looking at this giraffe uh, Evan, you probably have a great fear of these things, huh? Where are you at? You have a fear of everything. There you are. Uh, I don't know if you're terrified of Jeffrey or not. Um, wasn't a kangaroo, just giraffe. But these guys were dissecting a giraffe, and they kept going on and on about all the muscle structures and the throat and the esophagus and the lung size, the muscle that was around the heart, how big the brain was, how much, how much oxygen uh, the brain of a giraffe would require and how long the neck is. And they were going through all this super detailed stuff that I'm like, I have no idea what you're even talking about. None of it makes sense. And then finally one of them said it, the line that every Christian that ever watched that went, hello, where the guy said, it is amazing how giraffes are, are made and how they are. Because if this was off slightly, I mean by a little bit, the muscle structure, the esophagus, the airways, the lungs, all that, they would never get enough oxygen. There's no way this animal could or should survive. It's almost as if it was specifically designed this way. And it's like, how do you not see it? Clearly the giraffe was designed and created by a creator the way it is. The odds of that just randomly happening are, are just astronomical. But people believe that. Not because it's more believable than the God of the Bible, because they reject the God of the Bible. They despise that God. If you took ten pennies, here's a simple, very minute way of thinking of the universe. You took ten pennies and drew one on one penny, two on the next, three on the next penny, four, and all the way through ten, and, and just put them in your pocket, kind of shuffled it up. The odds of you pulling the penny with number one on it out first, what are those odds? Where's my mathematicians, huh? One in ten, thank you. Put it back in your pocket. Shuffle them up, draw the number two. What are those odds? What? How is that one out of ten? No, it's not. I'm saying after drawing the one out of, after if you draw the one first and the very next time draw the two. Okay. If you draw that one, what'd you say? Yes, one in a hundred would be the odds of that. Now the next one, the third one. Do y'all see the trend? Yes, one in a thousand. If you keep going, look, we're talking about nothing but ten pennies in your pocket. It would be one in four million to do that and to randomly draw one, put it back in, shuffle them, 
two, put it back in, kind of shuffle, three, four million. Have you, anybody ever really tried to count a million or something? Like, that, that's crazy, crazy high. No one's going to sit there draw in their pocket until that happens. Look, that's just a handful of pennies in your pocket. Go look at DNA. Go look at the human eye. Go look at a giraffe. Go look at a cactopus. I don't know. <laughs> you look at some of these things, and it is crazy the detail and the specificity that goes into some of these things. And people think that has just randomly happened because they reject the God of the Bible. Listen to what Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says. Listen to, to the first two verses of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The heavens declare the glory of God, it says. You go outside and look at the heavens, and they declare the glory of God. It's evident. It's there. So, number one, they suppress the truth. It's not that it's not there. They suppress it. Two, they pervert the truth. Look at what it says in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So it says, although they knew God, they did not honor him and give him thanks. They became futile in their heart and their minds and their thinking and their hearts were darkened. When it says their heart was darkened, uh, interesting translation. Uh, most times when you say that in the Bible, it, the literal translation would say their kidneys. Their kidneys are darkened. But in English, that does not make much sense at all. However, think about it. Anybody ever use the phrase, I have a gut feeling? What, what do you mean by that? That's what in my inner self, that's what me at my core, that's what I think. I have a gut feeling. And we use it kind of synonymously with saying like, well, in my heart, I feel this, or my gut, and that's kind of where that phrase, a gut feeling, comes from, because in the Bible, that's the way they spoke of it. Actually, their kidney, a lot of times in the Bible, when you see heart used, it's actually the word for a kidney, but we translate it differently because it helps to pervade that thought over. But all that to say, it's what it's getting at. These people knew God, but they didn't honor him. They did not give thanks to him. Their thinking was messed up, and at their core of who they are, it, they were darkened. In their very core, they were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but yet they were fools. A fool. That's what the Bible calls a fool. And y'all will love some of these word studies because you know what the word fool, it's where we get our English word moron. So you think of a moron. Now, a fool is not just someone who didn't quite get something correct. When we say fool, it's more like you're foolish. You know better, but you're doing something you shouldn't do. That's what we think of as a fool. So it's not a lack of knowledge. It's an act of how, it's a, a lack of how you act it out. It gets more to your character and your morals, not what's in your brain cells. Does that make sense to y'all? It's more in how you live and what you do with your life, those decisions that make you a fool or not. It's moronic, which means dull, not very sharp, not very smart. And so, then it says that they started to worship God, claiming to be wise, became fools. And it says, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. So it starts off with worshiping God, but they exchanged that for what? Images resembling mortal man. So now they're worshiping man. Then it goes to birds. They're flying out in the heavens. We'll start worshiping them. Then it goes to these quadrupeds, mammals, animals. Dogs, cows, goats, whatever, worshiping those kinds of creatures. And then all the way down to creeping things, which is another way of saying like reptiles. Creepy things that crawl on the ground that most people are grossed out by, saying you can't get lower than that. You're literally willing to worship some reptile, snake or a turtle or a, something like that on the ground. You're going to worship in exchange for the God who created everything that you see. That's how foolish you have become. Because you have perverted the truth. You've perverted it, and you can't get any lower than that. So, one, they suppress the truth, 
And in the truth it was there, they pervert it and twist it and worship other things. And thirdly, they act against the truth. So it changes how they live their very life. Not just what they ignore or what they try and twist, but then how their actions follow. They act against the truth. Um, we've seen why his wrath is there, right? It's the counterpart to his righteousness. We saw at the beginning. For the righteousness of God is revealed, verse 17, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. They're the exact same structure. Just one says righteousness, one says wrath. And he gives us those to kind of counter each other. So we've seen kind of why that wrath is, is there because of what we do. So how is that wrath carried out against these ungodly, unrighteous people? Look at verse 24 and 25. It says, therefore, so keep in mind, you had a lot of fours going through this passage. For, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, going all the way back to 16. For, righteousness is revealed in this way. In verse 17, verse 18, for, the wrath of God is revealed. Verse 19, for, what can be known, it's been suppressed. Verse 20, for, his attributes were clear. But they've suppressed them, right? Verse uh, 21, for, although they knew God, they did not honor him. I mean, you can follow this all the way down. And then you get to 24, and he says, after looking at all that, therefore, what happened? What did God do? Verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, 25, we kind of already read that, right? They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. Look at 24, though. Really think about what 24 says. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because of what they did, because of the suppression and perverting of the truth, the ungodliness and the unrighteousness they lived, he said, fine, you do you. Go, live it out. Let's see how that works out for you. Let's try it out. Now, I don't want to gloss over this too quickly because next week is going to hinge on that part right there big time. And next week is going to be a big boy message. If you want to read ahead, you'll see why. But it's going to be about some mature things. But... This is an example of the wrath of abandonment. When God gets to the point where he says, okay, you're going to live an ungodly, wicked lifestyle, go do it. Let's see how that works for you. Go try it out. Anybody ever had your parents let you do something you probably should not have been allowed to do in order to teach you a lesson? Y'all probably can't think of those, but I bet your parents could sure tell me a few things. Look, here's a simple example that won't embarrass my kids because I've got three of my four kids that are actually in youth now. I have to be careful. I can't use all of them. But sweet little chatty. She's three. Everybody loves her. Cute as she can be. But you know what she's not great at? Putting on lipstick. She's not real good at mascara, but she loves to wear it. She loves makeup. She sees her big sister put it on and get all pretty, and she wants makeup. She wants it. And so she'll get it, and she'll sit there and put it on, and she will come out so proud. I mean, just grinning and showing, Mama, look, Daddy, look. And that lipstick, y'all, is from here. It's, it's almost like you're trying to paint your face to be a clown at a circus, right? It's lipstick everywhere. It's black, like just all over the place. I've got some pictures of Miss Rachel where, where Chatty put makeup on her, and, and they're hilarious. And you look at it, and just as proud as she can be, and we would say, well, that is the most foolish thing. Like, what a fool to do. But she's three. She's a kid. She's supposed to do that, right? Now, if you did that at, like, whatever, 15, 17, if you're a 30-year-old, 40-year-old woman, 50, whatever, you know, and you've been around long enough, you're not three years old, and you put your makeup on that way, would be kind of look like that is foolish on your part. I, I can't believe, but... Sometimes you let kids do something because it's kind of like you need to realize you, you can't do this. There are times your kids want to put their own shoes on and they cannot do it. They can't work that buckle and all. They just can't get it. But they're determined. 
If you've been around a kid, if they want to do something, they're going to do it, and they will scream and fuss. So you just kind of, okay, fine, do it. And after a while, they get fed up, and they say, I need some help. Daddy, can you help me? You put my shoes on. Yes, I will help you. But at times, you get to the point where you say, okay, fine, go do it. Let's see how that works for you. And it fails. Maybe you've tried to cook something. I don't need help, Mom or Dad. I got this. I got this. And sure enough, a little while later, they come back. Okay, how do you do this? Because I can't figure it out, right? We've probably all had that moment at some point because you got to the point, you rejected and rejected, said, I don't want it. I don't want your help. I do not want it. Until finally the parent says, okay, I'm going to abandon you. I'm going to step away. You go do your thing. I'm done. That's what God has done here with these people. They have suppressed the truth, perverted the truth, acted out against the truth, and said, I despise that God to where God says, okay, fine. Go live your unrighteous, ungodly lifestyle. Let's see how that goes for you. Let's see how that goes for you. There was a, there was a story I read <laughs> uh, about a church years ago this guy attended and had a big old field next to the church, and the guy owned tons of land, and he was a farmer. He farmed for a living, and the guy was not a Christian, and he used to mock at the church and laugh, and every Sunday morning, he would find the biggest, loudest tractor he had and find some way to bush hog or something right next to that church to make all the racket he could to disrupt the church because he thought religion was silly, God is silly, doesn't exist, those people are wasting their time, and so that's what this guy would do repeatedly. He mocked them and laughed at them and one day decided to write the pastor a letter. And he wrote this big, long letter saying, look what I do. I live my life how I want to live. I don't give any money to the church. I don't give any time to the church. I never pray. I do what I want to do with all of my time, totally reject everything y'all believe, and yet look at my crops. He had the most beautiful crop of corn you'd ever seen. When October hit, he went and harvested his fields and made a killing had a huge crop, and he couldn't help but giggle and laugh and think, man, look how blessed I am. So he wrote the pastor this letter explaining all this stuff and said, and sent it to him, and the pastor replied with a one-line response, witty little pastor, but he had one line he wrote back that said, the Lord does not settle his accounts in October. In other words, you may think you're living the life now, and you are blessed, and you may be blessed right now, but if you suppress God, pervert his truth, and live against him until he abandons you, mark my words, that wrath will come, period. It is promised, it is here in scripture. Don't think, oh, look at me, I'm blessed. You may be blessed for the here and now, but God does not settle his accounts in October. Look, that's why to go back to last week, Paul started and said, listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel because whether you're the farmer who hates the church and is trying to disrupt it and boasting about his crops or whether you're the godly person that's sitting here going to church every day but yet not taking your faith seriously. You're here because mom and dad make you go. No matter who you are, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power to save any of you. And Paul proclaimed that gospel Paul goes out and preaches it to everyone. And we're going to see that as we continue on through the first couple chapters of Romans. But tells them that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But if you put your complete faith and trust in him, he says in chapter 10, anyone who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth will be saved. Paul can confidently say, I'm not ashamed of that message because that has the power to save you and save you from this wrath of God that will surely come if you suppress the truth, pervert the truth, and live out against the truth. So listen, if you're saved, and you may, then you probably know someone who would fit that, who rejects God, maybe not outwardly, but with their life and their actions. Listen, don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's the dunamis. Remember, power, dynamite. It's the power to change and save them. Be like Paul. Don't be ashamed. Bring that gospel to them. Don't sit back and watch them suppress and pervert the truth and live out against it. Bring them the gospel. 
But if you're here and you don't know the gospel and you say, I'm just here, I don't know. I've been coming because somebody else brought me. Then the Bible says, repent of your sins and believe in Christ and you will be saved. Talk to us. Let us know. Come to someone here, anybody, me, any of these adults. They are all capable to help you out and to, to see you through making that decision to follow Christ. And so, regardless who you are or where you are in your faith, think about what the wrath of God is. We don't talk about it enough. It's real. It's there. Think about it and reach out to those who you feel would be in the way of God's wrath if it were to come down now because the gospel is for them. Let's pray, and then we'll break up into our small groups.